This will be our third message in this short letter. And today's message is going to be focusing on verses 8 to 11. As we start and touch upon the characteristics of the apostates. This actually, Lord willing, will be a, the first part of a two-part message. Next week being the second part as we delve into the different characteristics of apostates and false teachers. Uh, next week's text, Lord willing, will be actually verses uh, 12 to 16. And actually, before we get, begin, I was this past Wednesday when at prayer meeting, I was talking to Elder Arnold and Jean, and was saying that as going over this text and seeing, in particular, in Jude's letter, verse eight through sixteen, there's such a meaty portion of the letter, kind of the heart of it, where he really delves into the characteristics and kind of almost like an anatomy of what false teachers and apostates really are. And I was saying it was my desire, really, to kind of for this morning to kind of go through all of those verses. Because when you talk about things that are, are not really pleasant to talk about, you kind of want to get through them. You know, you really don't want to harp upon it. Because there's a lot of stuff here that is repetitive in some sense, but yet bringing out a new truth. There's a lot of things that are talking about that are just uncomfortable sometimes to talk about, quite frankly. But as Gene was saying, that, and you realize that God's Word, that, that all of God's Word is profitable for correction or reproof. We realize that. And there's times... And I know Pastor George had this burden last week as the message that he shared when the woe to the different cities that were out there, that we feel that same way. It's like you kind of, you don't really want to be talking about this as much, but yet there's times when you need to. You need to be talking about these things because it's stuff that the church needs to hear. And that's really what Jude is laying forth to us in this letter, is that's things that we need to hear because these things are all around us. It's not just something that happened in the day and age that he lived in. It's something that we're experiencing today. So... That's why this message is broken down into two parts. This morning will be 8 to 11, and Lord willing, like I said, next week will be 12 to 16. Also within that is that, as you look at these verses, you'll see that in certain points, there's things that need to be explained a little bit further. So we're on a one progression where we're moving on, on this one road, but then there's times where we kind of have to de deviate a little bit and go off onto little rabbit trails to explain certain things that may not be clear from the text itself. But before we get into those verses, I think it's important, once again, that we do a little recap of what we've spoken about up to this point. Like I said, this is the third message that we're in the letter of Jude. And so far, in the two messages that we have spoken about, we've covered the first seven verses. And if you remember, we spoke about the purpose of Jude's writing, is that although he did desire to write about the common salvation, all right, and we also mentioned that him being Jesus' half-brother, he probably would be privy to things about Jesus that people didn't know of. So these are the things that he probably wanted to share, but yet the Holy Spirit had a different idea for him. The Holy Spirit called upon him to write a letter that was more of a defense of the faith and a protection against certain things that were coming about. So we realized that, again, the defense of the faith was again, again going to be about certain men that had crept in unnoticed and they were seeking to draw people away from the truth. So Jude sets the scene for us by telling us some of the things that these men do. Namely, turning the grace of God into lewdness and denying Jesus Christ as Lord. He goes on to tell us in these first seven verses that it's not something that's taken God by surprise because their condemnation is sure. We know that. Nor, we should, nor should we be surprised because, and as the last message we talked about, the Old Testament does provide us with plenty of examples of this apostasy. And as we said, the last message we talked about the unbelieving Israelites, the fallen angels, and we talked about the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. And we also wanted to stress in those two messages that very often that preaching and teaching of God's Word is calling to us remembrance of the truths that are already known to us. Right? We had said that lots of times when you're preaching and teaching, there's not a lot of new information that's being put forth. What it really is is recalling of things that we should already know that we've read and bringing us to remembrance because we have a tendency to easily forget. That's why the Word is constantly telling us to do so, right? Repeating things over and over again. Because we realize that sometimes we just don't remember. So that's the purpose of preaching and teaching. Obviously glorifying God, but to bring forth these truths that we may proclaim them. So that brings us this morning to our text. Like I said, it begins in verse 8. And what we have in these verses, 8 to 11, is really a further description of what we're dealing with. As Jude, through the use of other Old Testament examples extra-biblical texts and almost poetic language that we'll see more next week, 
He describes the character of false teachers. So let's look at verse 8. Verse 8 tells us, Likewise also these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. Now building off the examples in verse 5 to 7, verse 8 says, right, likewise these dreamers. Now the Greek word used for dreamers indicates that he's speaking in the present tense here, meaning that this is a continual practice, being a dreamer. It was not uncommon for the Lord to speak to people through dreams, right? We see that in the Old Testament and the New Testament. There are countless examples of this. However, the tone in this verse speaks of people who live in a world that is not in tune with reality. Their dreams contribute to their moral impurity because they're based on subjective experiences and not informed by the Word of God. So it's more of what they think as opposed to what God would have them to say. In many instances, false prophets will claim that their dreams are indeed a word from God. We see this all the time, right? We see this especially on TV, where false teachers are going to stand up in front of large crowds claiming that they've received the word from the Lord. I've received the word from the Lord, and they proclaim it to the people. And although this goes on today, it's not a new phenomenon. The Bible tells us of other times where this occurred. In Deuteronomy 13, verses 1 to 3, Moses tells us, if there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you as sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder comes to pass, of which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So again, this is nothing new. But notice that it is possible for a false prophet to have a prediction to come true or to work some kind of sign. But that's not the ultimate test of truth. The truth comes from whether or not the message is in accordance with the scriptures. If not, the way to trust God and His Word over any experience that we have, no matter how convincing it might be. Amen. And this is going to be particularly true of us in the last days where we're going to see a lot of that. I was thinking just in the account of Moses. And you think of Moses when Moses comes to Pharaoh. right? And Moses comes to Pharaoh and some of the signs that he brings forth in order to show the power of God. And it tells us there that, that Pharaoh's magicians were able to do, replicate some of those. Now whether they did it you know, by the way we look at magic today by sleight of hand or whatnot, or whether it was actually demonically done, they still were able to do certain signs there. So Pharaoh initially wasn't, wasn't buying it because his people were able to do the same thing. So we've got to be very conscious of that and aware of that. Just because we see a sign or something that might come forth, even though it might be true or might appear to be that, if it's in contradiction of God's word, then we need to completely refrain from it and get away from it. But Jude identifies, he goes further now, they're basing everything on their dreams, right? Subjective dreams. And their dreams very often are an essential matter. And it leads to the three different ways in which these false teachers, we know that they're not speaking for the Lord. Right? They're always going to make themselves manifest at one point or another. The first is that they defile the flesh. Right? Jude's connecting them to the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, and that their sensual behavior is apparent. To be defiled is simply an outworking of the inner man. It's natural to the apostate because they have no way of controlling their behavior. They are walking according to the flesh. Many of the dreams that they have may be of the sensual nature, and that brings out this defilement. So defiling the flesh is one of the key things, and that's the first thing he mentions. The second thing he mentions is the idea is that they reject authority. They reject all authority, right, false teachers, whether it's divine or civil. They firmly make themselves their own authority. Self is on the throne, and self is firmly entrenched there. Much like Israel in the book of Judges, where every man did what was right in his own eyes. Sometimes it's outright rejection, and other times it could be subversive. Right? Sometimes we could be rejecting authority, but we make it seem as though we we're not. So it could be outright, or it could be subversive, but either way, it's rejecting authority. And we know that God is a God of order, and He's established for us boundaries and set up authorities in order to keep that order. Right? We've talked about it in the past, right? particularly He set up government right, to keep society in check. And on a smaller level, he's kept the family in order to keep the family in check. 
But we as Christians need to guard against this tendency because it's not just false prophets and apostates who have the tendency to reject authority. We do as well. By nature, in our fallen selves, we don't like authority. In commenting on this, David Guzik says that one of the ways Christians are guilty of this is that they choose to believe certain passages of the Bible but not other passages. And he likes to call it the salad bar of Christianity where you come to the salad bar and you're like, I'm going to take this and not this, take this and not that. And that's something that a lot of Christians can be guilty of. We see something that we like that appeals to us. Ooh, I'm drawn towards this. And then there's something else. They're like, ooh, I don't like that. That, you know, there's something about that that just doesn't go against, it goes against what I feel. You know, you read the scriptures long enough, you're going to come across something that's going to make you uncomfortable. The key is, is that we have to embrace it. And we have to ask God's grace in order to help us to understand and to obey it. Not to turn away from it. We see this illustrated in Mark chapter 7. Right? When in con- confronting the Pharisees, Jesus rebukes them for setting aside the commandment of God. Specifically, the commandment to honor one's mother and father in order to keep their traditions. Right? They set aside God's commandment in order to keep their traditions, but their traditions were more important, so they were re- rejecting God. And a while back, if you remember, in Sunday school, we were studying in the book, we studied the book Respectable Sins by Jerry Bridges. A wonderful little book. And the title of it really says it all. Even amongst the Christians, right? We have respectable sins. There are certain sins that we'll point to the world and say, the world is wrong. Look what the world is doing. But it's okay if I do this. This is not such a big deal. That's a smaller sin. Our failure is an indication of our constant temptation to have our own way. And ultimately, a rejection of authority is a rejection of God himself. The laws that God has put in place, he put in place for a reason. People in particular, false teachers, may choose to ignore them, but the laws of God, just as the laws of the land, have penalties, and those who disobey them are going to have to deal with the consequences. Now the third way which they do is they speak evil of dignitaries. We have to ask, what's meant by dignitaries? is not completely clear from this verse. But if you look at the subsequent verse in verse 9, and in the parallel account, because a lot of this is actually repeated, or is, is also said in 2 Peter chapter 2 in regards to false prophets. The dignitaries here is most likely referring to angels, but also because of the rejection of authority in their character, it's not out of the realm of possibility that it also refers to the apostles or other leaders of the church. So dignitaries really could be anybody really in a position of authority. Particularly here in the context, though, it seems to be pointing towards angels. False teachers do not show the proper respect in that they have no qualms with being too casual or slanderous in their speech. If one's going to re- reject authority, then why not also speak evil of authority? Right? It's just simply an outworking of their heart. Now this takes us to verse 9 now, where you see an immediate contrast to the people in verse 8. It says, Yet Michael, the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed over the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Now before we actually actually delve into this verse, I think it's important that this is one of those little rabbit trails that we have to kind of talk about. Is that this account that we have here is found nowhere else in the scriptures. So there is an interpretive challenge that we face here, but I think it's one that's easily explained. Like I said, this dispute that we're talking about between Michael and the devil, it's not found anywhere in Scripture. We know that the archangel Michael is the chief angel of God who leads the holy angels and has struggled with Satan on other occasions, and particularly in Daniel chapter 10. So Michael is mentioned in in the Scriptures. We know that. However, the account of the dispute of Moses' body is not mentioned in the Old Testament. The closest we have to anything mentioning about Moses and his body is in Deuteronomy chapter 34, verses 5 to 6, where it tells us that Moses had died on Mount Nebo in the land of Moab, and that the Lord is the one who actually buried him, so that no one knows where his grave is. So we ask ourselves, what is the evidence of this dispute that we have, if, it's, if Jude is referencing something that's not found in Scripture? Well, this account is actually found is in the pseudopigraphal book, The Assumption of Moses, which is actually not part of the canon of Scripture. The portion that gives the account is lost, but it was confirmed by three of the early church fathers. Clement, Origen, and Didymus, all early church fathers who did confirm the fact that this Assumption of Moses did exist, and that the account of Michael 
and uh, the devil disputing over Moses' body was found in there. So we know the three people, independent people, were saying that this actual account did happen according to that. But then we have to ask ourselves, why would we accept this source as reliable if it's not part of the canon of Scripture? The most important reason for us to say is that ultimately Jude, we have to remember, just like all the writers of the New and Old Testament, are writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So that the information that's found here would be accurate, even if other parts of that work are not true. Also, there are other examples in the Bible of authors of Scripture using material that's not found elsewhere in the Bible. Paul does so in Acts 17.28 and in Titus 1.12 when he quotes a Cretan poet. Right? So the Cretan poet is proclaiming things that are not biblically true, but yet they were true for the time and setting. So he quotes them, but we're not, he's not giving credence to the other thing that that gentleman might have been saying. Pastors obviously do it all the time when they reference a quote from a book, right? Or a statistic from a survey, right? The things that we might be speaking about, all, we're not giving credence and we're not giving validity to all of that book per se, but you can pick things out of it that are true. And if it's going to be used to further the case, then it, that's, that's certainly allowed to be done. Again, remember, being under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So again, the point is that simply stating a truth from something other than the Bible is not always wrong, and it doesn't necessarily give complete affirmation to the validity of the work. We just have to be careful in how we do it. Obviously, in the scriptures here, Jude is doing that, so we know that that account is true. Now, having confirmed that this event, in fact, did take place, the next question that we have to ask ourselves is, what ground did Satan lay claim to the body of Moses, and why would the body of Moses be important to him? Why would he want it? To the first question, the answer is most likely to be because Satan, as we're told, is the great accuser of God's people. And he would object to Moses being raised to eternal life based upon two factors. One is his sin in Meribah, when Moses struck the rock, the very sin that prevented Moses from going into the promised land. So he would accuse, accuse Moses of committing that sin. And then years earlier, when Moses killed the Egyptian, was guilty of murder. So Satan would be accusing and would be accusing Moses of committing those two crimes. So that, because of that, he would lay claim of that, and then saying that he would not have eternal life, and that he would not have access to, to be with the Lord. He was holding his sin against him as his accuser. Another reason is that, also, is that because the body is physical, Satan would lay claim to it because of his control of the material world. So he had two reasons why he would want it. One is because of his accusations, and one because he thinks it's the physical body of Moses and that he claims ownership to that. So those are his two arguments to say why it is that he should be the one to have the body of Moses. And then we ask ourselves, well, why does he actually want the body of Moses? And I think that would be pretty clear. Because he would want it, because he would use it to draw people away from the Lord. Right? Satan understands this very well. He knows that we desire tangible evidence to have before us all the time. Right? We need to see something. That's who we are. We need to see it in order for us to believe it. And having the body of Moses would also be a way of drawing people away from it because if we had the body of Moses, we are, let's be honest, as a people, we are an idol-making factory. We like to make idols of things. So if you had the body of Moses that you could put on display, the people would be immediately drawn away towards that body and they would end up worshipping it probably. Right? It's happened in scripture, it happens today. How often do you see, sometimes you turn on TV and, and on a tree bark, you know, someone sees what they think is a picture of Jesus on a tree bark and immediately people go to flock it and they set up shrines around it and they go to worship it and they have to touch it as if that tree had some power to it. How much more do you imagine if we had the body of Moses would people be drawn away from the Lord? He wants us to worship him in spirit and truth and instead we'd be wor worshiping a decaying corpse. So we realize that, that Satan is very, very strategic. He's not, he's, he knows exactly what he's doing and this would be the reason why he would want it. Now having said all that, that's how we know that this account is true and this is why these, Michael and Satan are disputing over this. But notice, like I said when we first started this verse, is that there's a contrast now between Michael and the false teachers. Now Michael being the chief angel has tremendous power, we know that. 
Yet, in disputing with the devil, he does not use it, but he rather defers to the Lord. He does not pass sentence or take the law into his own hands, but instead he shows his reverence for the Lord in holy matters. Whereas false teachers are careless to speak, in a, speak evil in a flippant manner, Michael simply says, the Lord rebuke you. And this serves for us as an example. It is not that the devil is deserving of any type of honor, but he is to be respected for his power that he has because it's far greater than ours. And we don't step out onto our own in order to do that. And before we go any further, I really think that there's two points that I want to bring up from these verses by way of application that, that really kind of hit me when I was going through this. The first is that we need to be very careful on how we deal with Satan and the demonic world. And we need to have Michael be an example for us. We know that the Bible tells us that he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world, right? 1 John 4.4. 4. And this is true, but it doesn't give us a license for us to become arrogant and think that we can do things in our own strength and power. When God clearly in his word by this example is telling us not to. That verse, 1 John 4.4, 4, illustrates the wonderful truth that God does protect us and will keep us from the dangers of falling prey to heretical teachings. Yet to engage in passing judgment upon the devil or his demons is not upon our own authority to do so. So we need to be careful of, of anyone who attempts, a preacher or anyone who attempts by inspiring the people not to be afraid, who takes on the devil in his own power. Ligon Duncan, a pastor down in South Carolina, tells the story of a television preacher reclaiming to account the experience of the demonic. And it went like this. He said, this preacher now speaking, I was present in this room and the demonic force came in and the temperatures of this room dropped to subarctic levels. Everything began to frost over and then the furniture began to levitate. And I addressed that spirit and I told him to get out. And he fled through the window. And the furniture fell to the floor and the temperature returned to its norm. But then I leaned out the window and I said, You come back here. I haven't finished with you yet. You put that furniture right back where you found it. Now that might be an inspiring story. That might be one that would get people to shout hallelujah and clap their hands and get really excited. But that's not what we're here to do. And that's not biblical. Notice that in everything that that man said, he said, I. I say to you, I did this. You do that because I said that. Right? That's not what we're called to do. Right? The devil's not afraid of us. He's not afraid of us. Yes, we're to speak out, right? We resist the devil and he will flee from us, but we don't resist the devil in our own power and our own abilities. We resist it with the Holy Spirit. And much like Michael, the Lord rebuke you, that we leave it up to the to the God. We leave it up to God in order to fight our battles for us. We don't do it independently from Him. Now the second point, and this one I felt really convicted about. It's in regards to authority. Again, we recognize that all authority is ultimately granted by the Lord. Whether it's an employer or a politician, the person that's in charge has been placed there by the Lord. Now when the person we serve under happens to be a Christian, or if, even not a Christian, but they happen to be somebody that we agree with politically, then lots of times it's easier for us to serve under them. But when they're not, I think you get the idea. It could be a lot more difficult. The Bible tells us to submit to authority, to authority, to pray for our leaders, and not to curse a ruler of the people, but to show honor to whom honor is due. Right, we talked about this, Pastor George mentioned it, and I had a few messages in regards to Ephesians, the whole idea of Ephesians 5.21, the concept that began with the submitting to one another in the reverence of, of God, and then how that developed into all of the relationship, relationships that we have, that we're to submit one another. And that's what we're called to do. And we realize that we get awfully close sometimes to doing that. And we live in a day and age, perhaps like politically, where we may not be in agreement with what's going on. And, and that's fine. We understand that there are a lot of things that are going on that we're not going to agree with. Right? Moral issues. But then there's other political and there's economic issues as well. And praise God, we live in a democratically elected society where we're able to vote, we're exercise our opinion and all that. And we're free to do that. And that's fine. And we have that. 
But sometimes I think for us, we, we do, while we obey in one sense, with the actual act, there's a tone and there's an underlying of, of animosity that we may have. And I've noticed that, and I, sometimes I notice that in my own heart, and it's something I've been convicted of. Yes, we like the American way of life, right? We like lower taxes. We like all of those different things, right? But there's a time, I think, where sometimes the American way of life ends up becoming a hindrance to our Christian walk. And we realize that this is, just a, this is just temporary. Ultimately, our Christian walk and being drawing closer to the Lord is what we desire to do. Because this isn't our home. We have a home that's elsewhere. So it doesn't give us a right to disrespect the office of the land, right? We need to give heed to the commands of God. And I think one of the things that happens to us is that we, we all suffer from this disease. That we, we all have this disease that we think that the world began the day we were born. So we lose frame of reference as to what it was like in the past. So we live in the here and now and think, oh, well, things are so bad. Well, this president or this mayor or this governor is the worst that we've ever had. And we forget what it was like in the past. You know, you look through history or you look through the scriptures and you see some of the accounts. I mean, the people that Jesus was dealing with in his time, the rulers then, were brutal, were wicked. I mean, there was no mercy very often with the people. I mean, you see, crucifixion was, Christ was crucified, but that was a normal way of killing people back then. You know, and we realize that, that sometimes what we think is bad now, relatively speaking, is not bad the way it was in the past. So we have to be mindful and cautious of that. You know, how many times is a leader in our country compared to Hitler? Right? Well, comparing him to Hitler, it's dangerous. We think, of, we think of the Apostle Paul in Acts 23, when he's speaking to the Sanhedrin, and the high priest Ananias commanded those by him to strike him. Right? And after he struck, Paul speaks out in anger. But then he immediately corrects himself and he says, no, that wasn't right. He quotes Exodus 22, 8, 28 and saying that you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Now, if there was ever a ruler of the people that someone to be spoke an evil of, it was this Ananias who happened to be the high priest at this time when Paul was, when Paul was addressing them. This guy was really, really wicked. Very wicked. One of the most corrupt and cruelest of all of Israel's high priests. Yet Paul gives him the honor of his office. So I think that it's one of those lessons that we need to learn for ourselves. Well, we may be cavalier in, in the way we throw around names of certain people. I think it's important for us, and I think it's important to teach the younger people that when we address, whether it's the mayor or the president, that we address them by their title and that, to do so. I mean, we may not agree, we're not going to agree, but I think at the end of the day, we're called to do what God will have us to do, and that's to submit to those that are over us. If they ask us to do something that's in defiance of God's word, obviously we're not going to participate. But in all other things we can, and we can show honor to who the honor is to. The next verse, as we go, continue, is in verse 10. It says, But these speak evil of whatever they do not know, and whatever they know naturally, like brute beasts, in these things they corrupt themselves. Now not only do they speak evil of dignitaries, they also speak evil of things they don't know, namely spiritual realities. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they have foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Instead, they act out in their natural. Right? Notice how Jude compares them to brute beasts, because that's what wild animals do. They act out, they act out in their natural instincts. False teachers and apostates are intellectually arrogant, they're spiritually ignorant, and they're blinded by the God of this world. And ultimately, just like the brute beasts of the field, they will be destroyed. We hear it all the time, right, of ministers or people in positions of power and they fall into a terrible scandal and it destroys their reputation. Right, we see it happening. Because they may be speaking on something that they're not aware of, or they fall into their natural instincts. Men of such power that you say, how can someone so smart who knows so much about so many different things allow himself to fall prey to the simple vices of this world? And they do. Right? Nobody's immune to it. And it happens. And it happens time and time again. And they fall prey to that. But sad to say, it's not just false teachers that this can happen to. It can happen to all of us. 
If we stop listening to the voice of God, instead listen to the voices in our culture and those around us, we can lose our spiritual desires and instead fall back into the ways of the old man. Right? The Christian life is being active. It's being active and moving forward. Right? We talk about it all the time. It's a walk. It's one step in front of the other and proceeding forward. If you turn away from certain things, if you stop reading your Bible, if you stop praying, right, you lose abilities. You lose knowledge. You lose things. Right? Just like if you practice in the piano. If you play the piano and you stop playing the piano for a long period of time, you know, when you go back to it, you know, you might remember certain things, but it doesn't flow as easily as it does in the past. You know, just as we looked at verses 5 to 7, we talked in the last message, right? Rather than obeying the Lord, Israel instead listened to the false report of the spies. The angels listened to the voice of the devil. And Sodom and Gomorrah listened to their animal basic instincts. They went back to their default positions instead of listening to the God little uh, quote here that, that I, by a guy by the name of Samuel Smiles. Sow a thought and you reap an act. You sow an act and you reap a habit. You sow a habit and you reap a character. You sow a character and you reap a destiny. How true is that? Verse 11. Woe to them for they have gone in the way of Cain, have run greedily in the era of Balaam for profit, and perished in the way of Korah. Woe. Powerful word. It's a word of unspeakable grief. It's probably one of the most frightening words that can ever be spoken to a person. It speaks of sorrowful pity as much as it does of righteous anger. How frequently do we see it being used in the Gospels by Jesus? In his message last week, right, Pastor George preached from Luke 10, where Jesus proclaims woe upon the cities, who despite having the benefit of having so many of the mighty works of Jesus being done there, and having his presence among them to preach and to teach them real truth, so many of them did fail to repent of their ways. And the judgment upon them was going to be greater than those that were in Sodom and Gomorrah. And you think about the gravity of that, right? Much like those cities, so too are those whom Jude is speaking, to, speaking of in this letter. In keeping with his theme of comparisons, Jude once again provides three Old Testament examples, this time of men, who were privileged with access either directly or indirectly to the Lord, yet they turned away to apostasy. If Hebrews 11 can be rightly called the hall of faith as a chapter in the Bible, then Jude verse 11 could be called the Hall of Shame. The first of the three mentioned here is Cain. Now the story of Cain is found in the fourth chapter of Genesis. We're all told that he's the offspring of Adam and Eve and that he has a brother named Abel. And most of us know the story, right? We, that's one of the first story, early stories that we're going to usually come to know when we come to know the Bible, right? Because it's in the beginning. We know that both men, Abel and his brother Cain, bring sacrifices to the Lord, but only Abel's sacrifice is deemed worthy. Cain is angry toward God and he's jealous of his brother because his sacrifice wasn't accepted. But despite his sin, God is merciful to him. He confronts his behavior and he offers Cain correction. But Cain refuses to accept instruction Instead, he chooses the path of rebellion, which ultimately leads, leads him to commit the first murder that we have in the scriptures. He kills his brother Abel. And false teachers also resemble Cain in that they don't want to follow the instruction of the Lord because they're not willing to change. And in effect, judgment ends up being brought upon their ministry. They allow jealousy, right? Jealousy is that powerful thing that works in people's lives. And you don't want to hear it. You don't want to hear the correction because I want what I want. And he's jealous of his brother. And he kills his brother because of that jealousy. And he's ultimately rejecting God. We think of the Sadducees also in Acts chapter 5, right? They were jealous of, it tells us that they were jealous of the apostles as the apostles were preaching and the people started being gathered to them. They were jealous and their desire was to kill them, right? They wanted to kill the apostles. They wanted to destroy them. The second man named is Balaam. And his account is found in Numbers 22 to 25. 
Balaam is a real interesting man in the scriptures. A prophet by all accounts, by who all accounts had, he had ability and he had a reputation. And from what we're told in Numbers 22, we have is that Israel had completed their conquest of the Transjordan. And now they're on the plains of Moab and they're about to enter into Canaan. We know that it doesn't quite happen that way, right? They end up being, because of their unbelief, delayed. But as the, the scene is being set in numbers, they are potentially ready to go in to the, the promised land. Now while there, we're introduced to a man by the name of Balak, who's the king of Moab. And understandably, he becomes concerned, fearing that his people are the next to be defeated. Word had spread, even in ancient the ancient world, where it had spread pretty quickly of everything that Israel had been doing. Not only had they uh, escaped from Egypt and the great wonders and signs that God had done there and God was with them, but now as they were moving on, they were defeating nation after nation. And he realized that his nation was probably next, because here he, Israel was right on the plains of Moab. He realized he couldn't defeat them militarily, so he's quite concerned. So what does he do? He seeks out the prophet Balaam. Again, Balaam had quite a reputation. And his hopes was that Balaam was going to pronounce a curse on Israel. And he comes to Balaam, and in verse 6 of Numbers 22, it says, For I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. This was the reputation of Balaam. Balaam is brought upon the scene, and as the account unfolds, we see that he does actually have communication with the Lord. At one point even calling him the Lord my God. But we also know about Balaam and that he was polytheistic in nature and that he probably worshipped many gods. So as Balak is seeking Balaam to curse the people of Israel, what ends up happening is that Balaam is not allowed to curse the people of Israel. Because as he, speak, as he hears from the Lord... He prophesies, but he prophesies nothing but blessings upon the nation of Israel. Immediate and future blessings. And understandably, Balak is getting upset about this because this is not what he had called him out to do. And he had offered him all this wealth and offered him all these different things. And the interesting thing about Balaam is that Balaam has such direct contact with the Lord in this area. And he's being told things that he can and cannot do. And he knows he's limited by that. But yet his desire for that wealth is still there. He still wants that wealth. His desire for the wealth is, is greater than his desire to know the Lord. He recognizes that he's forbidden by the Lord to pronounce a curse upon Israel. But what he does instead is, is that he devises another way, and this way is very subversive. He suggests, that the way, he suggests to the Midianites and the Moabites that the way to destruction for Israel would be to entice their men with the women of Midian in order to draw them into harlotry and the worship of false idols. So if we can't attack them in a frontal assault, we need to come around and we need to find another way to do that. Again, despite what is obvious to him and having heard from the Lord in regards to Israel, the Bible tells us in 2 Peter 2, 15-16, that Balaam is not concerned with being obedient to the Lord, but is instead primarily concerned with the wages of unrighteousness. He's a greedy man who proves to be more concerned with wealth and popularity, and he ends up proving to be one of the greatest or most dangerous false teachers of Scripture. Now think about it. Jude's comparing the false teacher of his day, and we can say by extension us this day, to those, to, to Balaam. The comparisons to desire for fame and fortune are all too familiar, and many of the ministries that we know and have heard of, right, are well known for that. But notice also, not only is he comparing it, these uh, false teachers, then, and we can say now to Balaam, right, he doesn't just leave it there, because Balaam's also mentioned somewhere else in Scripture as well. And it's a warning for the church. It's a warning for a church, and it's a warning for us. And in Revelation 2, uh, verse 14, in addressing the church of Pergamos, Jesus says that of the things he had against them, one of them is they're willing to compromise. And in verse 14 he says, but I have a few things against you because you have those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things, sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. So in the account of Balaam, there's a lesson for us as a church as well, is that we're not 
obviously to hold to anything like that. And then if we see something like that, it's incumbent upon us to bring it forth, to expose it for what it really is. So we have to be on guard of those who are going to lead us astray. You know, we also have to be in a position not to put ourselves or anyone else in a position where they may sin. Right? The Bible tells us, talks about that. Jesus tells us, right, that that's temptation and whatnot are going to come upon you. But woe to the person, right, who leads someone into temptation. So there's a greater condemnation on those people, and Balaam in particular. So we have to be on guard against both those. Those who would perhaps lead us, and we have to also be on guard that we wouldn't lead someone else into temptation. The final person mentioned is Korah. Another Old Testament example, Korah represents a clear rejection of the authority of God and the, de and the desire to do what all sin ultimately seeks, placing ourselves on the throne. The account is, the account is found in no number 16. Korah was of the tribe of Levi, just like Moses and Aaron. And being of the tribe of Levi, and in particular, a son of Koath, he had responsibilities in the tabernacle. He had a specific calling that he was supposed to do, right? He had duties that he was supposed to do. But this was evidently not enough for him. He wanted to be somebody more important. He wanted to be the priest. Not content to the calling that God placed upon him, he along with 250 others confront Moses, and they state their case, which is simply this, that the whole congregation is holy, and that Moses and Aaron have exalted themselves over the rest of the people. And this is known as Korah's rebellion. As the account unfolds, Moses pleads his case to the Lord, and the scene is set so that on the following day, Korah and 250 of his followers are told to bring their censers filled with incense, and that Aaron was also to do the same, being the high priest. They would be present before the Lord, and the Lord heard Moses cry, so that Moses announces and says that though... <coughs> that the way in which the people would know whether or not the Lord had called him into this position would be that if these men were going to die naturally or in a common way to all men, then the Lord was not with him. But if they were to die in a new way with the earth opening up as to swallow them alive, then it was clear that they had rejected the Lord. What ends up happening is that the men perish because the earth does literally open up and swallow them. And their rejection of Moses and Aaron and their rejection, ultimately, of God is punished for this. God had given them a calling. God had placed them in a certain role. That is what he expected from them. And they were to do their duty. But that is not what they wanted to do. They wanted something greater for themselves. And they challenged against the person and people who God had put in the ultimate authority, Moses and Aaron. And they wanted to be that. They weren't content to be where they were. And the rebellion of Korah is an example of what also can happen in churches too. And it's a lesson for us, I think. The desire for power and influence in the church has caused divisions and splits. And historically speaking, it's not always a bad thing when that happens. Because if there is serious, serious doctrinal error, it may need to happen where there need, may need to be a split. But on the other side, there's also times where it happens when it's not necessary. And it's done because someone is maybe perhaps too ambitious. Or maybe an associate pastor in a church is not content with their position and wants to be the senior pastor. Feeling maybe that their gifts are not being properly used. And they attempt to destroy the unity of church by usurping the authority. A number of years ago I went to a, a burglary in a church in Brooklyn that had a process. And as I get there, the church was pretty much ransacked. You know. There had been a lot of stuff all over the place. There was vandalism committed within the church, and a lot of uh, equipment and stuff had been taken. And as the story kind of unfolded, and you kind of get to see what exactly had really happened, this wasn't like one of those independent acts of someone just coming off the street and coming into the church. What had happened in this church, and I believe the church was about 250 people, but they had a senior pastor, but they also had an associate pastor. And apparently the associate pastor, much similar to this, was not happy being in the position that he was being in. So he kind of worked and gathered together a group of people that were loyal to him, and behind the scenes he started to bring up a division within the church. So much to the point where he ended up having just about half of the congregation, I think almost, literally, that were siding with him and wanted him to be the pastor. Whereas the senior pastor now, unknowingly to him, this was going on. So there was a division now of 
250 people pretty much split, one siding with one pastor and one with the other pastor. The associate pastor ends up leaving the church and taking with him all of these people and the, leaves the church now, leaving the other half back behind and leaving them in a position now where they, where they were struggling financially, struggling spiritually, struggling in a lot of different ways. A lot of animosity, as you can imagine, was being brought by this. The burglary now, interestingly enough, happens is that there was no forced entry into the church, meaning that whoever came into the church had a key, and that the things that were taken were all things that were taken where you had to know where they were, so it's a person that was familiar with the church, Certain supplies were taken where you would need if you were perhaps starting your own church that you would need. And it was just one, an vandalism that was done specifically directed towards certain people. And you saw that within, in this, within this church. And, and, and it broke my heart when I was there to see all that. And, and the division that happened in that because of a rebellion that came up. And I don't believe that the rebellion was because of anything doctrinally. I think it was more like a personality thing. And you see that that can happen even today. So we have these three historical examples in verse 11, along with the other characteristics mentioned in verses 8 to 10. I wish we were done with this, but unfortunately there is more to say on this topic. And in order to keep us informed, so next week we will pick up in verses 12 to 16. But I want to close this morning by asking, hopefully answering the question of why these false teachers, or in general apostates, exhibit this behavior. And the easy answer is because they're unregenerate. And while this is certainly true, I believe there's a little bit more to it. Right, we go back to verse 4 in Jude and we realize it says that these men turn the grace of God into lewdness. Grace is wonderful and it's beautiful. It's God's unmerited favor upon us and it's by grace through faith that we're saved. Right? We understand that. But unfortunately for some people their understanding of grace stops there. And it's not seen as God's power in our lives that helps us to be obedient. Too often people will have grace and they think that grace offers them an opportunity to sin. Which the scriptures clearly teach us is not the case. But a lot of people will teach that. That grace, because we're saved by grace, that it allows us to just go and do whatever we want. Now we would question the fact that people who would believe and teach that are not actually truly saved because they don't have an understanding of it. But yet, nonetheless, it's something that's dangerous that's being taught. And we have to be on guard against that. We know that we're no longer under the law, which was impossible for us to keep, but rather we're under grace. But not being under the law doesn't mean that God's moral law is done away with. And like I said, false teachers and apostates will often live this out. And they're not going to be afraid to lead others in this direction. We need to see grace as glorious. We sing amazing grace for what it is. That it's not just what happens to us when we're saved, it's what happens to us throughout our Christian life. Right? It's justifying power, justifying power, and it's a sanctifying power that we have. And for us, individually, in our own walk, we have to be on guard and watch constantly. Right? Because our heart will always have the tendency sometimes to go back towards thinking those things. So we have to be constantly walking and growing in grace. So I want you to ask yourself a couple of questions and see where you fall and what your answers would be to this question. First question would be, are you uncomfortable with any of the commands of Scripture? Are there things in Scripture that make you uncomfortable that you just really, like we said before, are kind of like the salad bar of Christianity we just don't really want to think about? The second question is, does authority in any form bother you? Whatever it might be whether it be in the household of your parents, whether it be at work, whether it be the, the rulers of the land, or, or just being told you can't do something when you're, when you're somewhere. You know, you're driving down the street and there's a roadblock and they say you gotta go make a left and you can't go this way. Does that bother you? Does, does authority bother you? Number three, to ask yourself, do you rely more upon your own thoughts and dreams rather than what the Word of God says? well, I think this, or I think this is the way that it should be, or we've always done it this way, and this is our tradition, so to speak. And does it conflict with the Word of God? And the last one, in particular, I think this is important as a church, 
is do you struggle with being around other Christians because you might have been hurt in the past and you're fearful of opening up to others? All of these are questions that I think we need to ask ourselves and I think Jude kind of brings that out in this letter. Not only is he addressing false teachers and apostates, but he's addressing us as well. That we have to see where is it that we find ourselves in this or do we find ourselves in this at all? And these are probing questions that are brought out in these verses in order to help us reflect and think so that we may grow in grace. Right? Grace is incredible because its power is limitless. And it helps us to do what we can't do for ourselves. It's as John Piper says, Grace is an active, present, transformative, obedience-enabling power. Wow. Right? There's a lot there. So let us be reminded of that in all our dealings, whether in our individual walk or collectively together as a church. We want to seek the unity that we can. But we also want to be able to identify any threats that may come our way in the church, in our own particular walk. And I pray that God would make us a people that by His grace would be strengthened to see through error, to see where it is that we need to correct in our own lives, and then to ask Him to work through us that we could be more like His Son, Jesus. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, our Lord God, we do thank you for this morning. And I praise you, Lord, for this time spent in the epistle of Jude. I thank you, Lord, for grace. Lord, we talk about grace, Lord, and sometimes it could be just a byword of the Christian faith. But yet grace is so powerful. And grace is limitless. And grace is offered to us, Lord, not only, Lord, at the moment of salvation, but it is offered to us, Lord, constantly, each and every day, as we grow in Christ-likeness. And I pray, O oh God, that we would turn to you always, Lord, and we would not turn to our own ways and all false ways of thinking, but we would turn to the tr truth that is found in your scriptures, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that we would encourage one another as well in those truths. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us. And thank you because you are a wonderful God. We just praise you, Lord, this morning and say that we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.